Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Hawaii. And I'm Pamela Lawrence in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Winter in Adelaide. Welcome to Dog Edition, the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today, we are gonna take a deep dive into one of the largest dog health studies. And while it's focused on golden retrievers, the outcome could be important to all dog breeds and all dog lovers. And then later in the show, author Sassafras Lowry and I explore the ways in which we can have more intentional relationships with our dogs. Of course, don't forget, we'll stop by the hydrant later too, as we pour over the doggy headlines that caught our attention this week. So if you love dogs as much as we do, and dog puns, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. We've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey Pepper, wanna go for a walk? So before we jump into our first segment, I have a bit of a doggy dilemma that I would love. Dun, 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 dun. Doggy <laughs> dilemma. Okay, what is that? Oh my gosh. So I have a neighbor that lives directly behind me, and they have a dog, a young dog, beautiful, and it spends all day and all night outside in the yard and is upset by things like, you know, fire trucks going by, sirens, and uh, and it wails, and it sounds very unhappy and uncomfortable. And we're in the middle of a heat wave, so... Do I ring the bell, kidnap the dog? (laughs) What do I do? (laughs) Definitely kidnap the dog. I'm going to go for that. No, I think that this is something that so many people go through. My best friend has a dog next door where she lives in Adelaide and there's been three reports to the local council for someone to do something Mm. and she's spoken to the neighbour who's now started to get really angsty and and it's it's turning into a thing. You have to do something. You can't just let this poor dog be out in the heat. What what are the temperatures like this time of year? Well, right now today we're, we are in a heat wave this week, and today it's about eighty five. So not horrible, but yeah. but yeah, it's hot. It's about having a duty of care, isn't it? Even not as an owner. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. I think so. I don't know. You know, the dog is out there at all hours of the night, which is concerning because we do have some interesting wildlife around here. So it's uh, like, what do you mean interesting wildlife? Oh, (laughs) Uh, so we've had some mountain lions uh, sightings. (laughs) Just 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 a mountain lion. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little little mountain lion strolling up the street and uh, and coyotes, which I think are, you know, relatively harmless and (laughs) and some bobcats, which I don't don't think that a little puppy is going to want to deal with a mountain lion, a coyote (laughs) or a bobcat. Any of it, right? I'd ring the doorbell. (laughs) All right. (laughs) That's going to be my plan. I'm going to ring the doorbell and I will report back on on how that goes. Okay, let us know how that goes. (laughs) If I'm not here next week, you'll know why. (laughs) It was lovely to know you, Pam. I'll be seeing ya. So what do, what do we have on uh, on tap for the first story? Well, we're going to take a look at another serious issue. Though the playful, happy-go-lucky golden retriever makes these sweet and endearing dog breeds one of the most popular in America and right up there in countries right around the world. But sadly, these friendly and lovable pooches rate highly on another scale. So goldens have a 60% chance of getting cancer one of the highest in the dog world. It's something I didn't know, though I'm sure golden uh, owners do know this. It's definitely distressing for the dogs and their owners, but it's also a statistic that has baffled researchers and medical specialists for decades. So to gather the long-term data needed to help understand why the cancer rate is so high among the breed, the Morris Animal Foundation started the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Nine years on and 3,000 Goldens later, the research remains pivotal in the search for the truth about this unwanted phenomenon. Jim has the story. Liz, hi. Hey, Jake. Here's Jake. (laughs) It's been a while since these humans and furry friends last caught up. Oh, no, Astro, we have Rumble. (laughs) We have Rumble Bumble. As they chat away effortlessly on Zoom, you may have thought they were old school friends from way back when. But in actual fact, it's their ever-loving golden retrievers and a very special mission that brought them together. So I'm Liz Rubenstein, and this is Jake. He's hero number 2699 in the study. My name is Valerie Robson. This is Astro. The little one is Rumble, but Astro is study dog number 11. He was actually a pilot dog. 
all the dogs are hero dogs. They each have their own hero number. It's like James Bond, you know, <laughs> 007. He's 26.99 or get smart, one of those. They're yeah. all hero dogs. <laughs> well, and actually, and when we lose a dog, they become our angel heroes um, in the study and will be forever a hero and forever remembered. Jake, Rumble, and Astro are three of the 3,044 golden retrievers involved in the largest and most comprehensive study of its kind, the Morris Animal Foundation Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Valerie explains. The study actually was developed to really look at lifestyle, um, genetics, backgrounds, and really look at why our dogs are getting more and more cancer. Golden Retrievers appear to have a cancer incidence of around 60%. Uh, if you look at dogs in general, it's around 25%. So that is a really, really high cancer risk. Janet Patterson Kane is Chief Scientific Officer with the Morris Animal Foundation. Her team has been working since 2012 to find out why Golden Retrievers are more likely to get cancer something that has stumped researchers and veterinarians for years. You know, we've followed 3,000 dogs for this long. We, got, we want to get as much as we can out of here, particularly, you know, with respect to cancer. And if you think about it, when a dog gets cancer in our study, we have samples from that dog for every year preceding it. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in finding out if there are early markers or signs uh, of cancer so we can start diagnosing this early. Diagnosing cancer early and preventing deaths is the holy grail for researchers, as it is for the likes of Valerie and Liz, who have both lost Goldens to cancer previously. They didn't have to think twice about joining the study. So we learned about it when we had our two prior Golden Retrievers and sadly, we lost both of them to cancer. And so having known about it, those dogs were too old to enroll in the study, but we were very interested in it, very excited about this large scale study they were doing. So then Jake became a family member of ours and we knew immediately that if there was anything we could do to help reduce the cancer rates in these dogs, we wanted to do our small part to participate in that. Most of the 3000 plus heroes who enrolled in the lifetime study started when they were young pups, between six months to two years old. Then there are the golden oldies who, when they enrolled, were older than 12 and who had not had cancer. These dogs serve as a control group or a baseline in the study for the researchers to compare their data against. But with the vitals of every dog meticulously tracked each year, being involved is a big ask. Oh my, it's an incredible involvement. Liz and I will get an alert on our computers that it's time for Jake or Astro's study visit, at which point we have to go to our computers, usually fortified with a glass of wine and a lot of water, because depending on the dog, that it easily is, it's about a six, 60 plus page questionnaire. The commitment from owners like Valerie and Liz, says Dr. Janet, are what make this study so unique and valuable. The owners fill out an extremely detailed questionnaire, you know, it looks at everything from what they're fed to how much exercise they get to their medical problems, and we get the veterinarians to do that as well. And the veterinarians take a series of samples, including serum, whole blood, urine, feces, hair, toenails, they're all sent to a biorepository where they're kept, uh, and we are collecting this data and the samples so that researchers uh, can use them with the primary aim of finding out what are the main risk factors for cancer, why are we seeing such a high incidence. At the other end are the researchers sifting through the DNA data of thousands of dogs. It's a massive job and one that will continue for the next few years at least all of these things that have happened to dogs, where they've lived, what they've been fed, the problems they may have had, what their genetics is, are there things that we can kind of pick out there that tell us there's an increased risk and that we should be more careful about certain things? Because most of cancer is not genetic, it is actually about the environment and what happens to people and dogs. 
For Dr. Janet, this project isn't just professional, it's also personal. As a pathologist, um, you know, you see these pretty terrible tumours, but now as an owner, I'm in the situation where I've got this dog that looks pretty healthy, uh, but he's got to have his leg amputated and chemotherapy. Um, my attitude to wanting to do that completely changed. So once it was my own dog, I couldn't do enough, you know, to keep him going. Satu massively beat the odds against osteosarcoma and died of old age at 14. But it was an experience that changed Dr. Janet's life and set her on a new course to fight cancer in dogs. Satu was a very special dog to me and I think everyone out there knows about those ones. Those ones include the angel heroes in the study who haven't made it. That is happening more and more often as the dogs get older and succumb to cancer and other diseases. Now the population of living dogs in the study is just 2,200. I find it kind of hard myself, you know, to see this and I think it brings it home how common it is uh, and what people have to go through. You know, we make a lot of effort um, to make sure they have a memorial for their dog, that we keep in touch, because uh, a lot of people, they're not just losing their dog, it's at that point they leave the study, uh, which has been such a big part of their lives. So we really do focus on, uh, you know, remaining in touch and supporting the people in the study, particularly now as we really get down to the bitter end. I mean, at some point, none of these dogs are still going to be with us. So that's kind of the reality of what we're doing. While researchers continue on their mission, hero owners stay in touch through Facebook, where a community has blossomed as a place to support one another through the good and bad times. When somebody's going through a hard time or they lose one of the heroes to cancer or something else, um, it's just such a, even even with difficult times, it's such a supportive, wonderful platform and place and group of people that it's just amazing to be part of that. Liz and Valerie know the likely end for their dogs, but remain committed to the study's outcome. An outcome, it's hoped, that will provide a better future for all dogs. It would be fantastic to have your dog sampled every year and pick these things up before they get to the stage that they do. And you can help this research by getting involved in the Morris Foundation's Stop Cancer Forever, that's forever, challenge. It's on June 26th, just a few days from now. You can sign up online, just choose a challenge and set a goal and get your friends and family on board to donate. Oh, and thanks to some very generous partners for the Morris Foundation, each donation will be matched dollar for dollar up to $200,000. Details and links are in our show notes today. And um, Dr. Janet, she was absolutely fascinating. Do you understand, though, you're going to be chatting much further with her on uh, one of our other very special shows? Dr. Janet is our guest this week on Dog Cancer Answers, which is actually Dog Podcast Network's first show. It's been on for years, and I have a conversation with Dr. Janet. Dog Cancer Answers is one of those shows that I tell people, like, I'm sorry, you have to listen to this, because the people who are listening to that show are dealing with dogs with cancer, whereas hopefully you're listening to the show because you're glad to hear it, and we are so glad that you're listening. Yeah, I think it, it creates a really nice community. Um, we'll be right back. You're listening to Dog Edition. Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup, the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What? is Everpup. Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. 
What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste, they find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple checked for quality. Seeing is believing. So try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon. But here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup Club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. Welcome back to Dog Edition. A dog can feel like stability in an unsteady life. Our human ups and downs may be tempered by the consistent love of a dog. Anyone with a dog can attest to this. But how do we change because of the relationships that we have with dogs? This is a question that Sassafras Lowry explores in much of the work that she does. Pam has the story. Um, I don't know what my first word was, but I would probably bet money it might have been dog. I have been obsessed with dogs um, absolutely my entire life. I have never known a moment that I was not obsessed with dogs. As I log on to my meeting with Sassafras Lowry, I'm greeted by this cheerful and passionate author who writes about LGBTQ people and dogs, now mostly about dogs. The list of awards for her books is impressive. Everything from American Library Association and Lambda to Dog Writers Association of America. Sassafras is also a certified trick dog instructor which may explain the friendly wave I received from a bear of a Newfoundland named Sirius. Sassafras says trick training is a way to strengthen your bond with your dog. And I'm really interested in the way that uh, tricks can be a catalyst for relationship building. I got really, really excited about them um, as part of the everything I do in my, my life, as well as professionally, um, when I adopted a former street dog who had a whole array of issues. She passed about a year and a half ago, but she was a huge, huge part of me really thinking about dog tricks as being more than just like a fun thing you might do, but really impacting your dogs um, and your relationship. And so that's what really got me into it. It's, you know, a huge part of my life, huge part of the writing that I do. And you saw my dog serious. We do a whole lot of trick stuff together. And that's no joke. Sirius is the first Newfoundland to earn the Grand Champion Trick Dog title. She was also the number one Newfoundland in the 2020 AKC National Trick Dog Competition. She's an AKC elite performer trick dog, has both novice and intermediate rally obedience titles, and qualified for 2021 Rally Nationals. She also has a few other companion dog titles. This dog has accomplished a lot. The ribbons and the awards lining the wall behind this pair are nice, but it's the meaningful relationship that forms between human and dog that's most exciting to Sassafras. Anytime we are spending time with our dogs, we are either building that relationship or we're, you know, could be, you know, in some way not really adding to that relationship positively. So my goal is always when we're spending time together to make that intentional time whenever we can. And so that means playing, that means training and tricks are just a really fun way to, to do that. Think about when you've passively spent time with your dog. Maybe they were curled up next to you while you were working or hovering around while you were cooking dinner. Now think of a scenario where both you and your dog are actively spending time together and are both benefiting in some way. Some of the books Sassafras writes are meant to foster that activity, like the first book in the Bedtime Stories for Rescue Dogs series. So William to the Rescue was the first book in the series, and it's, you know, about this little Chinese crested who has lots of feelings about um, what happens when his mom goes on a business trip. You know, I definitely wrote it with the idea of, you know, reading books to 
dogs that were stressed out, that were overwhelmed, that were, you know, new in homes is something that a lot of us do. It was something that I've done in the past and I knew lots of other people that did it. And I was like, what if there was a book that was like about dogs, uh, for dogs? Children, especially those learning to read, were drawn to the story and the act of reading to their dogs. Turns out, this is a real benefit for the child. Studies suggest in the presence of a dog, elementary school children were quicker, more concentrated, autonomous, and exact while performing tasks like reading. And when kids read to dogs, the dog learns to associate the action with safety, love, and affection. Sassafras carried this theme of mutual benefit through activity into another book called Chew This Journal. And so I came up with the idea of an activity book um, that you could do with your dog. And so it is this very fun, I think it's fun, um, collection of crafts and tricks and games. It's kind of all of my favorite things that I do with my own dogs. It's sort of a playbook for being intentional about how you spend time with your dog. For a deeper exploration of the human-dog bond, Sassafras wrote an experimental series, the first called Healing, Healing, the second, With Me, coming out this summer. And both of these collections are looking at relationships with dogs, my relationship with dogs over the course of my life, as well as um, sort of larger ruminations on life with dogs that or beyond my my experience. Sassafras plays with form on the page. You'll see course maps from dog sports like agility or rally obedience used as a way to frame and structure the story. Uh, so it's very different than some of my other work, but is uh, really sort of getting into more of like, what is that? What does that relationship look like? How do dogs change us? How do we change because of the relationship we have with those dogs? You might be wondering how Sassafras has changed because of a relationship with dogs. I can't I can't even imagine my life uh, without dogs. Dogs have been sort of the catalyst for the biggest the biggest moments of my life. And so in these collections, I'm really grappling with what does that look like? Like, who are we because of because of those dogs? A storyline that runs through the collections is Sassafras's relationships with Mercury, a dog she got when she was 18 and precariously housed. Mercury lived to be 17 and a half. He was with me through, you know, literally learning how to become an independent adult and through career changes and career developments and success. And um, what is, you know, what does that mean to sort of have this constant companion that is that is through that process? So my journey with him, when, when those relationships change in a different way. So I talk about like relationships beyond the rainbow bridge. What does it mean when they pass? And so lessons for all of us to be more intentional about the time we spend with our dogs and reflective on how we change each other. What does it mean to make like big life decisions because of dogs and how do dogs shift the what the shape of what our world looks like? She's so passionate about this topic. And it just, I just wanted to hear more from her. Um, I found that really fascinating, a real insight, actually. I love it. And she poses some really interesting questions, like what, you know, the question about making big decisions because of a dog. And I I know we are, we've become that, that family that does that. We are now the family that says, we'd love to go on vacation with you, but guess what? We're bringing our dogs. It's- or yeah, I'm not coming over because you have dogs or can you keep them tied up in a room while I come over? I'm like, mm, I don't think so. I know about those. Yeah. And completely changing your routine and how you do things because of your dog. When we first got got Harvey, we sort of took stock about six months later and realized that we didn't go out for dinner as much. And if we did, we sat in the cold freezing our butts off so we could take him with us. <laughs> it's it's mad. Who knew I turned into this person? <laughs> it's all worth it. <laughs> it's all worth it. Dogs use us as a very convenient tool and we are unwitting to their gestures. Okay, well, let's wander past the hydrant and catch up on some of the doggy headlines that we've come across this week. So we've been talking about golden retrievers a lot in this episode, 
And I came across this week a very loyal Golden who refused to leave its injured owner's side when she fell ill in Istanbul in Turkey. I don't know if you saw this. It's absolutely gorgeous. So after trying to get in the ambulance but being ushered away by paramedics, the pooch had other ideas and ran behind the van for several kilometres, never letting the ambulance get more than just a few metres away. Then when it got to the hospital, the woman's faithful friend watched on as she was ushered out of the ambulance into a wheelchair and into the hospital to be treated. And the dog just stood dutifully at the the front door, just keeping vigil on a red carpet, as it turns out, um, until being reunited with, um, with its owner. And it was all captured on mobile phone, and it is just delightful. I love it. i got to watch that video. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. You bet. Pam, what, what caught your attention? Well, I've been looking at butts. <laughs> butts? Again? <laughs> you have a fascination with butts. <laughs> well, just just corgi butts. Have you seen? <laughs> have you seen how? First of all, how adorable corgi butts are, just in general. But I saw a video that's been circulating uh, on TikTok and I'm sure various other social sites that uh, is of a, do- a corgi in a bathtub, and and the owner gently pushes the backside down. So the feet are touching the bottom of the bathtub and then releases her hands and the, the butt just floats up to the surface and the little legs rise up. And it's got to be the cutest thing I, I think I've ever seen. So, yeah, corgi butts. That's <laughs> what, why Is there, is there an I, explanation to why the butts float? Well, I wondered that, too. And I so I did try and do some research now, of course, just, you know, take this with what it's worth. I got it off the Internet, but <laughs> I read that uh, <laughs> that there's less muscle mass back there. So so that's why they're just they're just not as heavy. Uh, they float, and it's it's super cute. It's worth checking out. I'll I'll put a link to the video. I do love the idea of how you how you come about just wanting to test this theory. I don't know. I'll take my dog for a walk. No, actually, I'm going to put it in a bath and see if it's butt floats. Like <laughs> like where that even comes from. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a dog that I don't think will float very well, and that is Wasabi. Did you see Wasabi, who is the Pekingese who won the Westminster Dog Kennel Show last week? Yes. Yeah. And you know, I have a, a strong opinion about uh, about this whole thing. If you're if you'd like to hear it, I would be glad to share it. I think Bourbon the Whippet was completely robbed. He came in second and should have been first. Look, I don't have an opinion on. Um, a particular dog breed that should have won. I go for the name. That's generally how I choose anything, and that's probably why I win nothing. But wasabi, I mean, with a name like wasabi, if it's if it's not winning competitions, it should be on your sushi. Mm, hot and spicy. Well, we can agree on that, and even bourbon goes with wasabi. <laughs> True, very true. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for bringing Dog Edition with you on your walk. Now, chances are that before our next episode, you and your dog will be taking another walk. And we have something else for you to listen to. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, check out DPN's sister show, The Long Leash, for Jim's extended conversations. This week, you can hear my chat with Melissa Basilar, who is a celebrity pet matchmaker in Los Angeles. She will share some Hollywood tips. Tales. You should also listen to Dog Cancer Answers if you know someone who has a talk with cancer or if you're interested in learning more about this amazing golden retriever study that's at dogcanceranswers.com. And next time on Dog Edition, the Maremma Guardian Dogs protecting little penguins and endangered bandicoots. And I'll explain what bandicoots are when we catch up uh, next time on the show. They're all native to Australia. And because we are a trans-international show, we're going to move from Australia back to the Americas next week for the 4th of July. And everyone knows that dogs and fireworks don't necessarily get along, so we are going to have some tips for you on how to deal with that with your dogs. Until then, head along to dogedition.com where you can leave us a voicemail and share some of your stories with us. Just click on the little button that you'll find at the bottom right of every episode page. And check the show notes for links and information about the guests on this and of course all our other episodes. Also, we are looking for correspondence as we grow this podcast and Dog Podcast Network. So if you are a content producer, a journalist, a podcaster, an audio storyteller, a dog writer, Dean Kutz, we haven't heard back from you, who loves dogs, check out our 101 Dog Stories contest. 
there's over $15,000 in prize money. And be sure to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app. And if you don't mind, please leave us a review and tell a friend about the show. I'm Pamela Lawrence, and I'll see you at the dog park. I'm Caroline Winter, your resident news hound. And I'm James Jacobson. Thank you for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, we wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.